Sorry, I've kept you waiting, have I? That's okay. Right. Oh, that's a story in itself. Yeah. Okay, good. 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 <laughs> oh, yeah, it isn't always. What a great town. Been up there lately, have you? Not for some time since the Bronfman started to fold up. Oh. Because, you know, I'm not bilingual. I have okay. three, well, I'll say, I'll say that my three sentences in French. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Playing two leads, she's a but of course, I mean, if we think things are thin in the theatre, my God, opera. <laughs> you know, um, uh, Leon Major. Yeah, great old friend of mine. He's uh, directing opera in Washington. Oh well, he directed opera in Toronto, oh, but you see, people wouldn't know that. I saw his when, production when, 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 of uh, Cavalleria Rusticana and Pagliacci at the St. Lawrence Center. Okay, in the 70s then, or earlier? That would be, uh, God, I'm bad on days, it'd be the 70s. Good, because that's mm -hmm. why we didn't hit on it then. I, we, I would have been terribly ashamed if we didn't get it and it was the, like... He did a modernistic days. version of Cavalleria Rusticana, which was absolutely fabulous. It was very daring then, with people with bicycles and things, you know. Oh. It's, a, it's a 19th century Italian melodrama. Oh. <laughs> He brought it up to date. He also had a big scope and vision, eh? I mean, major? Well, major I, I, I've always felt uh, that he, that opera was quite a uh, forte for him, you know? Okay. He's also a very too nice. Well, often a too nice person will have this gruff. I'd rather, I'd <laughs> punitive. You do something wrong, you're supposed to go there. <laughs> Not sit on your ass watching color television. We now have a, a murderer of children who wonders why they won't let him out, Mr. Olson. Oh, yeah. I could tell him why they won't let him out, because he's a menace. Yes, I quite agree. And then, uh, a killer of children, 11 children. And Car Carla now is going to school again. <laughs> Carla Homoka. Oh, my oh God. well, that, I, I, that's beyond... Uh, that, we're getting into uh, Patrick Hamilton's rope with that, you know, where they kill the chap for a thrill and put him in a box. Okay. Ever seen that? No, I haven't. That's how it begins in a dark theatre, yeah. curtain close and a scream of terror. Somebody about your age. This is my challenge to make a transition from this topic to uh, the, the earlier days of your career in Canada. Because we're rolling. Oh, well, really? Oh, yeah, well, in that case. Well, I came, of course, in... <laughs> I came. Okay, now, let me see. I, so I want to start from TV. Because I believe that's where your theatre experience in Canada started. Yeah, well, it was very bad. I mean, it was, it was about the 1957, 58. I was doing quite a lot, but, uh, well, perhaps I should qualify that. It's, it, it's very easy. It's a, it's a national sport to go on kicking the CBC. But if I tell you that uh, one would work, say, for seven days on a half... Don't forget, it was all live. One would work for seven days on a 30-minute play, quite reasonably good. Um, on the sixth day of rehearsal, a strange person would come into the studio where you were rehearsing and in many cases begin to tell the director and most other people what they were doing that was wrong. Now, I, I don't think it takes an expert in theatre to realise that whoever is in charge must stay in charge all the way through, or you've got, I mean, he may be a dummy, but at least he's your dummy. He's your director. And so that, I felt, was a hopeless... When I first realised what was happening, somebody called an executive producer would come into the set, give notes. He'd never been there before. Give notes. And then you would have to adopt those notes. And I used to look at the producer a couple of times and say, what, what, what? And he'd say, go fight City Hall, kid. And that was my first lesson in the crass stupidity of CBC television. That was sponsor-free, wasn't it? Or did you also have sponsors? Oh, yes. Well, there? it was all sponsor-free. Well, no, it wasn't, actually. No. I remember one of the, uh, the half-hour ones uh, that we used to do was sponsored by Jell-O. Because Joel Aldred, who I hope is still hale and hearty, used to do the commercials. And so you'd have 15 minutes of acting. I use the term loosely. And then the announcer would come onto the set, ready in makeup to do his commercial. And then back to the... Uh, I mean, some young actors today pale at the thought of doing something live, like, like me talking here, if it was live, another person would say, it's live? No, we're taping it, and so it's all secure and safe. But 
I remember in one of the half hour television plays, which was live, it was called Follow Me, I won't bore you with the plot. But that was when I first started to work for Andrew Allen, who was the director of it. And it was quite fun. Uh, it had to do with science fiction, so it was very Frankensteinian. And we have this scene in the laboratory, myself and Ron Hartman, the actor. And for effect, they had test tubes and all sorts of things. They had a baboon from the zoo in a cage. And so on the day before the, uh, the shoot, he's walking through with the cameraman, Andrew, debonair, double-breasted suit, cigarette holder. And he, we come up towards the baboon who is in the cage masturbating, as baboons do. And so Andrew says, this will be a three-shot, Eamon, to the cameraman. It'll be a shot of Ron and the monkey and Sean. And if he's doing that, it'll be a two-shot. <laughs> and, and sure enough, it was a two-shot. <laughs> two shots, pretty good. You're putting the monkey there. You said you put... Sorry, but it costs a lot, I know there. How do I look now? Perfect. Not bad for my age? Great. <laughs> I noticed when you used the term acting vis-a-vis -vis television, it sounded like it was in quotation marks. Why? Well, uh, I don't want to deprecate what we did. I mean, everybody worked their very hardest. And some of the directors, I mean, don't let me give you the impression that they were all dumb, because they weren't. Uh, some of the fine directors, you know, like George McCowan and Eric Till and people like that, I had the privilege of working with them. Uh, we went into one-hour television. I remember I was, I think I was in the first, because it was GM Presents, it was called, General Motors, and McCowan directed that. And it was an Irish play called The Wind from the South, with John Vernon and Francis Highland and Tom Harvey and people like that. And it was quite the script was by James Costigan, a very good writer, and it was a superb show. Now, I can say that from my great age without feeling sort of uh, that because I was in it. In fact, when I did Freedom of the City on television, which is one of the finest television plays I think CBC has ever done, I called up the uh, <coughs> executive producer and said, this is the, some of the best television I've ever seen. I didn't even think that I was in it myself. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, you, you, you forget that, you know. In fact, when I watched it in what was called the Kremlin then on Jarvis Street, which was the CBC building, I was uh, unashamedly weeping at this, uh, at this film. You know, it was so wonderful. Brian Friedel's Freedom of the City. It was quite wonderful. Film, you say? It was a film? It wasn't live? Uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was taped television, videotape. Tell me about Three Strangers. Well, Three Strangers was one of the live half-hour ones. Uh, I, I thought it was very good. It was a story by Thomas Hardy. Once again, you had exec visits from the executive producer and so on, which I've never really... I mean, when you think that television started in 1952, basically, in Canada, and it also had been in vogue sometime in Britain. Now, in Britain, television, uh, you, you, you had the actors, and then they, the cameras moved down to a line on the floor. So you, what you've got is a photograph stage play. Canada, not knowing any better, used to move the camera in and around and take all sorts of shots. And, and people in Europe were saying, the stuff that's being done in Canada, you know, the marvellous plays. So they sent a cadre of producers from the BBC to study. People forget that. Here, in Toronto, to study. And then look what happened to our television. We kind of, it turned into, it, 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 CBC began to behave as if mediocrity was a virtue which is, you know, all wrong for... Anyway, I don't want to start getting on to that. But you did uh, give me some... Three Strangers uh, allowed me to work with George Luscombe, who's a wonderful chap. Uh, he, of course, later went on to found Toronto Workshop, Workshop Productions and became uh, quite famous as a director. I actually t liked his work, of course, as a director, but I found him to be an extremely impressive actor. I did that play with, uh, I think, Eric House and George Luscombe. And uh, I felt very honoured to be in their company, you know, because they were very good. And Andrew Allen directed. We're going to talk more about Andrew Allen in a minute, but uh, more of the producers, directors, executive producer names that strike you of the late 50s, early 60s. I think the Jewison was working around here. Did you know, you know I, was, I came after him. He'd gone on. He was working for the CBC. I don't think he ever produced. I think he was a cable puller or, you know, camera jockey or whatever, you know. Uh, 
and then he went on to great fame in the United States. And of course, he's an excellent director. I happened to meet him later at somebody's party and said, I'd never been to the cinema in which I hadn't got value for my money. And he looked at me and said, thank you. <laughs> he has never sold me short on a movie, Jewison. If he directed it, it's worth the money. <laughs> And what, what are the names then come to mind? Uh, they, well, there's Till, of course, an excellent director. He did Freedom of the City. Andrew Allen was, his heart, I think, and soul was still in radio. He was a great radio director. Although I was, I came in to Canada in 1957, and I, uh, I think it was three years before I, almost 1960, before I went into radio. The reason was very simple. Canada had a core elite of performers like John Draney, and Alec McKee, and Bud Knapp, Frank Petty, uh, John Bethune, uh, Tommy Tweed, do they need Sean? No, I mean they, they had the very best performers and uh, they performed actually almost exclusively in the field of radio. I think John Draney was probably the finest radio actor I ever encountered. I mean I knew his reputation in uh, when I was a student in England and uh, he was he was a extraordinary you, you know, a, a microphone in a radio studio, and yet he would actually, in your mind, change on the other side of the microphone, turn into an old black slave or a, a farmer on the prairie or whatever he was playing. He would become that. So instead of paying attention to what you're supposed to do, which is to play to the microphone, which is the ear of the listener, you're looking at this extraordinary man. <laughs> Most of the, what I learned about radio, I learned from Draney. I watched him like a hawk just like I used to watch Schofield in England on stage. As of course, you could only have listened to him as a hawker before he was on yes. radio. Uh, when, but you worked in television at a time when uh, the ground was not so fertile. Obviously, that's an open opportunity for you. Well, there seemed to be an awful lot of work around, it seems to me. I, I, I can remember the golden days of live half-hour television when I was in four different plays at the same time. Uh, but the producer would help you by letting you go 10 minutes early so you could race into another studio to rehearse because it's money. It's great camaraderie, you know. I also used to take part in a Sunday night television panel show called Fighting Words, which is how I, en I encountered Nathan Cohen. And uh, that was, you know, I, I, I think I was the first actor to appear on that because it was supposed to be totally non-dramatic, you know, you're talking about the crucial events of the day. So that when I was called by the producer and uh, they, they said, you, you, you do know that this, this is not a performance we're asking from you. You're supposed to be, I said, you, you mean I'm supposed to be an actor with a brain? <laughs> and then I went on and of course it was very good because they used to show it on television live on Sunday and then it was repeated, the soundtrack on Wednesday, so you got two fees. I'm very mercenary that way, you know, I, I don't believe in the artist sitting in a garret. I believe in being paid for what I do. I have two questions when someone offers me a part. Two words. How much? <laughs> but I still like to do good work, you know. Sorry, could you tell me that last thing again? Uh, just to say I wasn't listening. Fighting words? You, no, no, just a moment ago you said you had two questions. You oh, have I have two words. words. I, mean, I, think maybe I have two saying. words when anybody offers me any kind of work. Two words only. How much? Now, when I came to this country, don't forget, there was no, there was no arts and culture center in St. John's, there was no theater in New Brunswick, there was no national arts center, there was no Citadel Theater. The Manitoba Theater Center was the, at the corner of Portage and Maine, a windy, drafty old building. There was no St. Lawrence Center, there wasn't even an O'Keeffe Center. There was no Theater Calgary, there was no Vancouver Playhouse, there was no Bastion Theater in Victoria. None of that existed when I came. So I, I merely mention that because when some people, you know, start hanging crepe and talking to me about the terrible state of the theatre, I point out to them what has happened that is good in the theatre in the last 35, 37 years. The things that have now exist that didn't exist then at all, you know. So I reckon that the theatre will all, and that's my first love of course, the stage, I reckon the theatre will always be the fabulous invalid. There is no uh, I mean, it's always been dying, you know. People have been complaining in the 18th century. I mean, the, the expression that many people don't realize, getting the nut back, which is common parlance in New York, that's recouping your investment. That comes from the days when actors traveled in a cart with wheels, 
when you moved into the courtyard of a pub, the first thing the landlord did was take the nut that, took the, that held the wheel on. And when you paid your bills, you got the nut back. You didn't know that, did you? <laughs> But you, from your, uh, what did you study? What did you study? Where did I study? Your what? No, not where. What? Uh, you studied, did you study the theatre or did you apprentice in the theatre? or What made you want to be an actor and what brought you to Canada? Did you have a job here? Uh, no, I, I think it's probably the spirit of adventure. I used to always try to think of a smart answer to that, but no, I thought it was... I'd never done any television, of course. I had done some radio for the BBC, but no television. And I found that the entry into television acting, which was the coming thing, obviously, everybody knew that. I mean, now you're used to it, of course, it's now you've got 85 channels, so, you know, everything is in colour and you've got laptop computers and all sorts of things. But in my, in, when I started, I mean, it was all live. And I found that entry into CBC television was quite easy, you know. I mean, the BBC in London, where television took place mostly, was like a, a fort. I mean, you had a problem talking to the doorman <laughs> let alone getting inside, you know, to meet people. Here, it was extremely democratic. Now, at the uh, Toronto CBC building, of course, the new one, it's all very security-minded since a few years ago somebody would install all their typewriters. It's called closing the door after the horse has been taken away. <laughs> I thought Bill Gates stole all the typewriters. Huh? Uh, it was no anti beeb over here then, eh? Uh, you're talking about a time of sort of the jazzy four-letter word, uh, four-syllable word, pre-fragmentation. You mentioned 85 channels. So you came here at a time when there was like one. Well, there was, uh, yes, in fact, probably the CBC was the only game in town. They were our main engager. Uh, then came CTV. Uh, and I remember all the fuss, you know, when people were applying for the licenses, of course. Then came I don't know, Global and all the various other stations. There was no city television or anything like that. Now it's a lot of stations, you know. Uh, I mean, we have, and, and some of them are rather funny. I mean, you have a station with about four and a half outlets, calls itself Global, which to me is a word that implies worldwide, you know, but what the heck. Uh, Auntie Beeb, you mentioned, that's the Mother Corps, it would be called here. And of course, you know that Mother Corps here is in very bad trouble. I mean, uh, even the s smallest child who can read a newspaper must know that. And I think myself, in my own personal view, that when Auntie Beeb has a problem, such as the government sort of saying, we must do this and we must do that, the people say, get your hands off our auntie. Nobody says that in Canada. Nobody says, get your hands off the CBC, off Mother Corps. And I think that you have to earn the public concern. That's what I feel is the real problem. But you don't want to talk about that. It's, yeah. it's bad time, hard times. Uh, last question about it. Uh, I think it's your quote, where most of the uh, drama was on CBC and most of it was bad. Was it the yeah, well, uh, well I, I think, as I've said, uh, the, 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 I mean, one would hardly direct a stage play and then have somebody come in and tell you how to, how to do it, you know? That's why I'm never interested in uh, students coming to shows, theatre students. Uh, the press, of course, you've always got. They're like the poor. They'll always be with us, you know. You, you, you have reviewers will come, but I don't really want to hear an opinion of something I've done by another artist because it's always biased. Because deep down, the other artist, the actor, is saying, I could do that much better than he has. And I, I, I'm not interested in that because I'm doing it. I think you get talk, talk about that uh, Andrew Allen, whose initials AA may not be, have been the most uh, appropriate. Um, and by the way, try and use his name in your reply rather than he, just as a little reminder here. But how did you get involved with Andrew Allen? Well, I met him first on, uh, well, uh, the first time I ever encountered him, his uh, secretary had said, there's a gentleman who produces plays, he's come in from Vancouver, you should meet him. I think you'd get along very well. So I had an appointment with him. He had an office on Front Street then, he was with the CBC. And uh, he said, come in, come in, dear boy, you know, he was very sort of tall. And he said, oh, I've got an appointment to see an actress. Uh, and then we'll have lunch. And so I, I, I said, well, I'll, I'll wait out. He said, no, 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 sit over there. He's got a big office, so I sit in the chair. So I sat in the chair, by the way, in comes this actress, whose name I'm not going to tell you. I can't remember it anyway. And she reads the part for him. It's a happy ending, because she did, did the play. But I'm trying to look as if I'm not there, reading a newspaper, you see, because it's not my business. And when, all, when it was all over, she said, 
Mr. Allen, I, I would do anything for this part. Anything. And he pushed his glasses down and said, well, I hope it doesn't come to that. <laughs> and I thought, I like a man who <laughs> says something like that. And then we went off and had lunch. But that dry way, I hope it doesn't have to come to that. And then, of course, there was the, the incident with the baboon. Got all these things endeared me to him, and we became very good friends. I liked him, you know. That, that was actually your first impression of him. Then, that. And that was the first memory I have of him was with that actress. I would do anything for this part, <laughs> anything. And uh, then, of course, we uh, later on I, I hired him at the Citadel. You know, I mean, he worked for me when I was artistic director. He came and directed plays, and his. I also was responsible for getting him involved in the Shaw Festival in 1963. And I saw the remarkable effect that his presence had upon the burghers of uh, Niagara-on-the-Lake. You may not be, well, you probably wouldn't have been born then. Uh, you may not be aware that the burghers, those are the people that make up the shopkeepers and the people who live at Niagara-on-the-Lake, did not want the Shaw Festival. They did not want a lot of actors mincing and rambling around the streets and going into their shops and all the rest of it. They didn't want it until Andrew came and he spoke. I remember I attended a lunch. He spoke to all the service clubs, the, the uh, Rotary, Lions, Kinsmen, Kiwanis. The whole thing changed because he just talked. And then he spoke to the company before we started rehearsal and reminded them that we represented the profession and that they would be watching how they behaved and how we behaved. None of us falling around the streets drunk or, you know. And so he, uh, he was very, very instrumental in the way that it started. I gather he modeled himself on someone. What I heard about Andrew Allen is he came over quite young at a time when many of the, the, uh, the radio d drama heads were off fighting the war. Uh, yes, well, of course, I only came into his orbit in the late 50s when the war was all over. I knew that he had the famous story of him being torpedoed in, uh, on the Athenia. He was returning to Canada then. Uh, I also knew that he had a lot of very good friends like Draney and Fletcher Markle and so on, people he had known in Vancouver, John Bethune. And um, I also admired the regimentation when I finally went into Studio G, which is where all the great plays were done, uh, the business of addressing him as Mr. Allen, no matter how close they were to him. I never called him anything else but Mr. Allen when I was on the set. Uh, or uh, Sir, actually, <laughs> and he would call me Mr. Mulcahy, and since he was able to pronounce it, I was very flattered indeed, you know. I mean, I've been on the stage when a student has said, I have a question, Mr. Mulcooky. <laughs> and my main worry is to make sure the actors behind me don't laugh, because the kid would be destroyed, you know. <laughs> so, and that, they were the days of radio, and they were quite, I learned a lot about Canadian history by being in the plays. I played Darcy McGee, one of the fathers of Confederation, a lot. And, uh, of course, I played the first president of the Canadian Pacific Railroad. Tommy Tweed used to write these marvellous long plays, two-hour plays about Canadian history. And so it was a wonderful way to learn the romantic past of the country and be paid, which is, uh, get, we're back to how much. <laughs> and that was it, how much. <laughs> By the way, how much? Oh, I can't remember now. We didn't get paid all that heavily because, well, you know, the way the money has increased, for heaven's sake, you know. I've just done a play on stage uh, about Ellen Terry, and I was quite astonished, that's a 19th century English actress, that she was, I didn't know that before, that she was the highest paid woman in England. She's getting 200 pounds a week. That's in 1880, which would be about $20,000 now, a week, which is better than a stab in the eye with a cold kipper. <laughs> Never heard that one. Okay. <laughs> uh, but what did it take three years to bro break into radio? You've already hinted that it was uh, crowded with great talent. Uh, did you want to get into radio? Or well, I, uh, well, I, some work <coughs> well, well, television paid more. I keep harping on money. People think I'm terribly financially oriented. Um, uh, television paid more, so I was I was comfortable. You know, nice car, an apartment, and all the rest of it. But I thought the real good drama. The good plays were happening on CBC Radio, you know, and even then I was only in on the, the tail end of it. People like Frank Willis, Essa Young, Andrew Allen, 
uh, and se several James Kent, you know, people, really good directors. And that was where it was happening. I remember one of the first plays I did on radio was Venus Observed by Christopher Fry. Well, you, you never get into a, you never get a play like that being done on television then. It makes sense in a way because if you write a play that is extremely famous and very, does very well, you're going to ask a very big price if it's going to be put on the galloping snapshot screen, you know. It's, it's, so there you, you don't get the scripts, but on radio, I mean, I've acted in so many plays by Sean O'Casey on CBC Radio, who is, you know, like God. It would be very difficult to get his plays done on, on television. And so, there you are. Although he died a poor man. You didn't ask how much? <laughs> uh, please, uh, please, you know, hold tape. They have a good piece today in the paper about it. What's left of it? Do, what do you remember start. about Montreal? The food. Are we rolling again? I remember the food in, in all the times and all the plays that I've directed in Montreal. I have never had a bad meal. That's one thing. Then there was my famous encounter with the uh, Toronto, uh, Montreal police. I was directing a play, I, I think it might have been A Moon for the Misbegotten or something at the Bronfman, and I was staying with a friend in Westmount, and they had gone to their cottage in Vermont. So I got into Montreal about four in the morning and uh, took one of the suitcases out of my car, found the key under the flower pot, opened the door, went in, it's about four in the morning, took in one bag, went back to the car, got another bag, and this is an old Montreal house in Westmont with the doors are all down this passageway, and then I suddenly hear a word, Alray! And the unmistakable sound of a, a hammer being cocked on a 38. And I come out of the room and I put my hands up. There's a policeman at one end and one at the other. And I then say the most stupid words that have ever come out of my mouth. I'm Irish. <laughs> to which the cop said, we? Oui? <laughs> and then we all ended up in the kitchen having coffee. Uh, some neighbor had said, there's somebody breaking into that house. And I explained to the police, and they understood that a, a burglar doesn't take suitcases into a house, he takes them out of a house. <laughs> and everything was happy. And that was my encounter, but I will never forget in my overcoat saying, I'm Irish. <laughs> <laughs> and I had three sentences there, because of course I'm not bilingual. I speak Gaelic, but not uh, French. But I always used to say, because I would have a designer who was French usually, and the stage manager, wonderful supporters. So we're all artists. Je ne parle pas français. Je suis irlandais. Je suis très stupide. And they would all say, ah, bon. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> so there was no need to say any more. But I did a lot of plays. Uh, it was the premiere of uh, the Patrick Pierce Motel. The Bronfman Theatre was reasonably successful, but when, when I arrived with the Patrick Pierce Motel, we had lineups all the way around the block. You know, it was a fine theatre, and I liked it very much. Where was it? Can you tell me about the building and where it was situated? It was just, I know you went up Cotonage, and I can't remember, no, De Carri. De Carri Boulevard. It was, it was, I've written to that place so many times. It wasn't my first visit, of course. My first time came way back with instant theatre, which was Barry Mortar's idea. She was the producer of it. And when I said, how much, when they phoned me, uh, this was half our plays. To tell you how silly the whole thing, it's called Instant Theatre because the original uh, 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 sponsor was an instant beverage company and they backed out so they're stuck with the name. Nothing instant about it, you have to rehearse it like any other play. And so the plays were 25 minutes long, very important. You only had two hours from 12 to 2 because of the contractual arrangements with the actors, you see. And it was very good, you got a lot of very good actors because, you know, you can work from 12 to 2 in the afternoon and still go on stage at night in another play. But what they didn't think of, they said they would do the play four times in two hours. Well, you've only got to think about for a second that when you've done your 25 minutes, you've got to get the people out and the people in and have a cup of coffee and maybe a cigarette before you go back. So you ain't going to do it four times in two hours. So they found that out quite quickly and did it three times, which gave you time to change, get the audience out, get the audience in, 
And there were only about, I don't know, a hundred seats, maybe a hundred and fifty. And they charged a dollar a head and gave you a sandwich. The dear old days when money, you know, really bought something. And the, I know the, the sandwiches were wrapped in cellophane, so they didn't make a noise when people ate. And of course it was in the Place, uh, Place Ville-Marie. So they had the audiences from the offices. The place was packed. And I know I played in it once because uh, the actor, we had, there was a problem with the actor, and it was Chekhov's The Boer, which is a short play. And that's when I realized what my actors had been going through when I'd been directing. Because I would play the, do the play, Shmernoff, 25 minutes.